very excited to have Henrik Ekstam here today with us, uh, speaking about tea-lean organizations and specifically about how IKEA manages complexity. And I'll just leave it there and see where he takes us with his story. Um, one thing that I would like to mention is that as per the deal around the world standard practice, this session is being recorded. And just to let you know, if you do not wish to be recorded, you can turn off your video and change your name to a fake name. So you're not uh, recognizable in the recording later on. So I will also put that in the chat in case it's more clear if you read it. And yeah, so what's going to happen, a little brief introduction of how this session works. If you have been attending other sessions, this is a similar format, so you will not be surprised, but just in case someone hasn't attended other sessions, I'll just tell you that Henrik is going to be talking for about 20, 25 minutes. And after that, we will move into questions that will ideally build on the stories that he's told us so far. Now, to gather and organize your questions, we will be using Mentimeter. You can, I'll put the, the link in a moment, and then you can just uh, drop any questions as, as they bubble up along the way. And we will come back to them once Henrik has finished his story. You can also see what other people, are, the questions that other people are adding, and you can vote for them. So feel free to, if there's a question that you're really keen to hear about or that really resonates with you, just give them a little vote, a little thumbs up, and uh, that will help me choosing the order of the questions as well. Uh, now, you can also use the chat here on Zoom, but we're going to use it to make comments, to add any additional resources or information, or to just add your reflections or your reactions to what you're hearing. Do not put questions in the chat. I mean, if you put them there, I might miss them. I'm going to focus on the questions we have on Mentimeter, and I understand you'll be using the chat to interact and react. But if you put any questions there, there's a chance that I miss them. So don't be, don't be mad at me if that happens. Uh, so let me put the um, link to the Mentimeter in the chat. And what else was I going to say? Nothing. I think with that, I will hand it over to you, uh, Henrik. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. And uh, when it comes to standard yes. question, I, yeah, it looks yes, like you see, see the you. PowerPoint, right? Um, I see the PowerPoint, yes. Yeah. Right. It was embarrassing when you present the uh, speaker slides and stuff. So thank you for joining. I will try to speak a bit about some of the things I'm quite passionate about, and that is also understanding the sort of complexity and the limitations of the world. And of course, when life gives you lemon, make PowerPoints. Uh, I don't know if you have kids, but I guess you all talk to kids. I think one of the ways kids are bonding is finally to ask the right. So, what is your favorite meal? Meal. What do you like to eat? And uh, as a grown up, you go, hmm. For tonight, if I'm going on a date, if I'm going out with my din boss to have dinner, or is it the only food I'm going to eat for the rest of my life? And another thing you could reflect on is when you should decide what that dinner is. Is it fastest if you decide it yourself? Or if we all in this meeting need to vote, what should be our favorite food? And then, of course, if I tell you that we are all going on a trip to March, would that affect how we need to vote and how do we need to coordinate? Another thing worth reflecting on is how easy it is to correct the mistake. So do you, would you be more worried if you have a release when you can send patches or if you distribute in the physical world? And maybe we are sometimes taking that freedom a bit too easy, right? I was in the green room, all of us present this meeting, and we are all around the world, and at least for us in Europe, summer is approaching, and with summer, of course, beach season, and maybe some of you, including me, would like to lose a bit of weight. And then, of course, we could start training, but we could also look into the diet. With that said, my name is Henrik Ekstam. 
I'm born and raised in South and Sweden. Actually started engineering to be able to work abroad, but have never done that. Uh, used to work as a consultant, been with IKEA since 2014, mostly working in the area of customer relationship management, especially marketing. Uh, my job, job title is roadmap leader, but I call myself business architect still. And uh, I love analogies and I love principles because I think principles is a good way to navigate in complex world. And what I tried to introduce earlier was the principles I'm showing today. And uh, it's nothing special, but of course a question can have many answers depending on the context, right? In general, the more you need to align something, the slower the process is gonna be. The context of where you sit impacts your degrees of freedom. And how costly it is to make or correct a mistake spheres the speed you can have. And there's seldom only one answer to a question. And there could be several ways to reach that goal, right? And if that was the principles, I will try to explain a bit how I see the theory behind this. And it's in no way a doctor's thesis, but to give you some structure and background around it. So th this is a way we often look at things in IKEA. So what do you need to do? What do you do and how do you do it? And how dependent versus autonomous are you? And <clears throat> of course it's easy to say, oh, we should be agile, we should be team, uh, we should be autonomous. We love autonomous teams, right? We've been pursuing that for a couple of years in IKEA. On the lower side, we have the economy scale, so standardization, mass production. On the top side, we have speed and flexibility. But if we look at the, the justice system, do we really want speed and flexibility in that area? Or do we want the air traffic control to define their own ways of working? On the other hand, do we want a standardized governmental process for raising kids? So a lot of the time, when building an organization, you need to see where do we sit. And it's not a fixed position, it varies over time. And I will try to explain a bit why I think that's the case. So these are four different types of problems. Um, since I could, maybe shouldn't use the word problem, but opportunity, since it's a picture of my daughter Stella. She's a bit older today, but. Um, the first type of problem you see on the bottom right, and that's the obvious problem, right? It's a well understood problem, and there is a best practice for being new wheels. On the left hand side, we have a chaotic problem. Something is on fire. And when something is on fire, you don't sit down and make a project plan how to vector, it, right? You run. Hopefully, you have rehearsed before, but you need to regain control before you start evaluating. You don't do a pre study. On the top hand side, we have the complicated problem. That's the engineering today. So we know what we don't know. The problem Elon Musk is facing going to Mars is pretty much the same problem uh, NASA faced going to the moon 60 years ago. There are good practices, there are the domain of experts. And on the top left, we of course have the complex problem. We don't know what we don't know. I had no chance of knowing how Stella was 16 today would behave when she was one year old, right? You need to experiment to determine what is the problem? How can we build a good relationship? How can I bring her up to the best of my abilities? And this is the Kinevin framework by the uh, Wailish, the researcher Edward Snowden. If you haven't read about it, I can recommend. There are some links and previews in the material. But to simplify it a bit, I think the two most present, especially in human organizations, are the complex versus the complicated. And the complicated is the domain of the engineers. You have the blueprints, you have the engineering, you have the organizational shop. So a lot of project management comes from that domain because it comes from building complicated stuff, submarines, airplanes, spacecraft. The complex world is much more like a garden. 
you can't order a tree to grow in a certain place in the garden. You don't make a blueprint and say, this is how you're going to grow. And by DP3 in two years, you're going to be this high. You have to see how is the garden responding, um, et cetera. Um, and this is also reflected on how we look at leadership. So traditionally, we tend to see the leader as the mastermind, especially if you read old history books. It's all about the king or the general and their brilliant moves, right? Um, what came well before my time, but I would say in the 60s, is of course the leader as the motivator. Maybe John Dahl goes into that in one as well, right? But then it's more about saying the right thing, getting the energy up, rising the troops. And then we have this guy, the gardener, and any one of you who's watched Star Wars, I mean, how, how does Yoda help the rebellion to win? It's not by developing a super good strategy. It's not about teaching uh, Luke all the swift moves, right? It's about helping him finding himself. There's also a link to an article about Ingvar Kampka, the founder of IKEA, and you can try to see where you think he acts as a leader in this domain. Another thing that has affected the world in a more complex way is how history has evolved over human time. So I think at least one of you, since I know you're from Sweden, should know this person. It's the Swedish King Gustav III. He had this stupid habit of uh, waging war against his neighbors, so he ended up being shot by the Swedes. And of course, in that time, if you were living like me in Skåne, five, six hundred kilometers from Stockholm, it took weeks, unless months, before you even heard the king was shot, right? If we compare to this guy, the poor Muhammad, who turned himself on fire on the Tahiru Square, the whole world knew within minutes what was happening, and that was, of course, the start of the Arabic Spring. And if we look at this model, it says that speed and interdependence in the world has increased. We talk faster, we're more connected than ever before. That brings a lot of complexity. And of course, as we've seen before, a response to speed is autonomy or empowered execution, as it mentioned in this model. But that is not enough because then we're going to be uncoordinated. So we need to strive for some sort of shared consciousness. And that gives us adaptability which is one of the key things an organization needs nowadays. And according to Stanley McChrystal, the trust and the common purpose is the building block that you need to start building this around. And I do, I do agree, otherwise I wouldn't have shown the model right. And to summarize, I see the omni-channel as a complex adaptive system. A complex system, the weather, flock of birds, etc., is steered by the interaction of the individual components, and we can never predict how it behaves right. It's also adaptive at its response to the different changes. And uh, being a mix of both digital and human assets, it's, it becomes extremely complex, and we need to be able to respond to that. So, today's wisdom is from the engineer, Wendell Holmes, from the 19th century, who says that the simplicity on the other side of complexity is extremely valuable. And the way I interpret that quote is it's very easy to start simplistic. Uh, I guess you all heard of what, how hard could it be? You have an idea, you start like, yeah, if you want to lose weight, you just have to eat less than you spend, etc. And then you run into a lot of complexity. You need to grab something fast, uh, we've got leaving kids, you're invited to dinner, you name it, and it's hard to keep. But once you truly understand this complexity, you can start finding the simplicity. And it's very easy to mistake a simplistic approach for, us, uh, for simplicity. And that's when we start chasing silver bullets, at least. In the organizations I've been, we have had a fantastic <laughs> tendency to do that, right? You come up with an idea and then you're gonna apply it everywhere. And 
as a small side note, I think disruption simply means that simplicity has changed. So this is a picture of the first IKEA store. It's actually his parents' woodshed that outside in the campus farm, but that's where IKEA started. And then there was a lot of turbulent time and somewhere in the 60s, uh, it started in 1940s. Things had gone stable and the concept of the blue box and potato field started conquering the world. And now people have less cars, we have the uh, e-commerce, we have a different point of logistics. The benefit of mass production is much lower today than it was in the 60s, right? So to some extent, IKEA is disrupted and we need to find a new simplicity. How is IKEA gonna work and operate in the 21st century? Because being a strong single channel retailer with huge store outside the city is not fit for purpose. And uh, I guess some of you chose this session because it said IKEA. It's normally quite good public magnet. Uh, so I would try to explain a bit how we looked at things. And I, as I mentioned, uh, when I presented myself, I see myself as a business architect, even if that's not my title anymore. Um, and we are trying to use business capabilities. And I assume you're all aware with the concept of capabilities now, it's starting to spread. But a capability is just the ability to do something, to have a tree and make it fall down. That's the capability to tell trees. It says nothing on how you do it, right? And this allows us to give some distance to the things we do. And what we try to do is on high level, we try to describe, if we describe a change, what are the capabilities being impacted? And then bottom up, the team say, how are we contributing? And based on that picture, we try to see, are we getting the enough things? So a short semi-real example, like he uh, acquired a company called Tremont in the US. I guess all the US people are sleeping, so there's no one here, but who pretty much does the rest that IKEA doesn't. So they help you measure your kitchen, they help you plan it, they order the stuff, they assemble it, etc. And that means that when you are starting to join the Tremont kitchen journey, we have no way in IKEA to know that you are buying a kitchen from us, meaning that we don't just suppress other communication. So we have a gap in campaign management. We cannot see who's buying kitchen. And then, of course, if we look at the lower level capabilities, for instance, campaign planning, we try to move the customer database migrated into one because in that way we can see what are you doing. Oh, you have a bad experience. We just bought a kitchen, whatever it is. And that means that we can adapt the rest of our communication and not at least work against ourselves. And of course, that seems like a good idea, at least to me. Um, but is that really enough? Because that's where we started about a year ago. And if we look at the different things, we have a lot of different road strategies, presentations in IKEA to say where we want to go on different levels. And we have, of course, Jira, we have uh, AHA, which is a portfolio management system. We have our own developed uh, innovation tool. We have a project uh, transformation office. We have a project portfolio tool. All of these things have the things we do right. And if we start mapping all these to capabilities, top down, we can see the footprint. So what are the footprints for our sustainability actions? What is the footprint for our e-commerce? And bottom up, we can see what are the things we are building? Why are so many people working with customer data, et cetera? But it still doesn't make any sense, right? So then we started looking at the business motivation model which talks about the two dimensions I showed you in the beginning, so the end. What do we need to do or achieve? And how do we do it? And of course, uh, on the top level, you have your strategy and the goals. And then in IKEA, we're very action-oriented, so we don't love to jump to the activities and the output. But if you are 200,000 people, that becomes quite a lot, right? So you need something in between. Uh, a couple of years ago, we launched the con concept of OKRs, so objectives and key results, because we knew Google did it. Um, but as I showed you with uh, reducing weight, 
having an objective is not enough because there could be several different ways of reaching that objective and sometimes we are interdependent. So we need to have some sort of tactical view on the world. And if we take this for, to a more theoretical model, the business motivation model pretty much says that a goal could be addressed by several strategies. The goal is decomposed into objectives. But once again, the objective depends on the strategy you choose. If I want to lose weight and my strategy is to change my diet, having an objective of running uh, 20 kilometers per week, it's not really helpful, right? Because I'm never going to achieve it, even if that would help me reach the goal. And then the strategy needs to break down to tactics. And these might, of course, put or can put requirements for change on the IT operating model. So if we want to start selling furniture on the darknet, we would need to be able to accept Bitcoin as a payment. And currently, you can't pay the Bitcoin in IT, obviously. So if we look, for instance, uh, these are some of the IKEA's high-level goals. So our happy customers, our online conversion, how much we sell, etc. So nothing revolutionary, but broad common goals across IKEA. One of the strategies how to make new customers happier is to create services to complement the old idea of you do your part, we do our part. Because in the modern world, not everyone has a car, not everyone has the ability to send you the furniture themselves, etc. And that we have a number of different teams' objectives looking at it. So we want to create a service experience that lives up to IKEA customer needs. We want to make it easy to find and buy what I want, where I want, and when I buy it. And one of the tactics we are pursuing is to sell assembly services online, meaning that when you look at the website, you should be able to see I can get this furniture assembled, I would know the cost. Etc. That could be quite complex if you add several things to the basket, right? And that, of course, puts demands on our delivery planning, delivery scheduling, execution, of course, how we manage for sales order. I mean, if one piece of furniture is delayed, it's no point uh, sending out the assembly guy, right? Then we need to come twice. So you get a much more complicated distribution puzzle when you sell services too. And of course, we could me measure that, for instance, with our customer satisfaction measurement, which is my key as well called Pulse CX. And to manage that change, we have here, you see the same model, right? It goes down then to delegate problems to solve, which could be, for instance, we need to launch a rewards program, and we're going to do a pilot in Portugal. I don't know if we have any listeners from Portugal, but now we have a uh, IKEA reward system called IKEA Keys Live, which hopefully is going to come to the rest of the world soon. And of course, that's going to put pressure on uh, the customer journey, on our value streams, the capabilities we build. And then we need different athletes. And from a planning perspective, we don't really care how we manage to deliver. I mean, some things we do in the digital organization as agile teams, some things, for instance, rolling out and training is done as a project. And other things like business rules, tax uh, verifications, et cetera, is of course down the line. And all these have different types of scope which you need to see. Are we providing enough access to the need to be able to solve the problem we have ahead of us? So if we go back based on the theory and look at the um, principles I presented, one conclusion, as I said, there's most likely not one way of organizing, at least if you're bigger than 20 people, right? Uh, and of course, the more you need to align, the slower you are, so try to reduce the number of people you align, especially in the design phase. Um, the digital and the physical world well, follow different rules, for instance, of course, scaling in uh, the digital world is much easier. Uh, Try to use the customer journey of the outside view to see who needs to define and own this part of the customer journey, because otherwise you might end up in a broken journey or in uh, incomplete things. Uh, and of course, no matter how you do it, try to reduce risk, which is, of course normally means start small. 
and make sure that you are, have the same goals, that they are not conflicting, and that you use the same approach. I mean, if your goal is to have a Olympic medal, if I'm trying uh, sumo wrestling and you are trying marathon running, it's going to be hard to come together. So if we come back to uh, the picture where we started, what to do and how to do it, have it in mind, look at your own organization and see do we have different thoughts. I mean, accounting is probably quite scared on what to do and how to do it right. While of course, innovation should be quite free to define it. Try to define as is and to be, and decide how you're moving the wrong direction. That could be organizational change, it could be technology change. And once again, don't go chasing silver bullets. So for the different topics, which is important, try to look at this type of slider. If we say that all channels must be integrated and act in exactly the same way, you're gonna lose a lot of the benefits of the digital channel and the physical channel. If you make them too unique, you can get a very broken customer journey. So that, that is the type of balance you have to start defining. And just on top of my head, some um, small tips what you could do. I mean, if you want to have a more autonomous organization, create subsidiaries, different brands that pursue different goals. Of course, always delegate the accountability as far as you can and try to reduce the number of goals because the more goals you have, people can interpret them differently and you might end up having uh, conflict. How to do it, of course, I mean, try to decouple your architecture, try to introduce smaller changes, work with guardrails rather than steering, uh, try to agree at least on one problem to solve. Also remember that saying yes to something means saying no to something else. And try to build the agile mind of getting it right the last time culture, because that, of course, reduces the number of uh, test steering, agreements, committees, etc. And interestingly, a lot of this was known to Ingvar already in the 70s. So 20 years before he passed away, he wrote the Testament of the Furniture Dealer, which is his Bible, how to run IT and the legacy. I'm not sure if it's publicly available or not, but you can probably find it if you Google. Um, and he says a lot of wise things like the fear of making a mistake is the root of bureaucracy. No one can possibly enjoy doing a job unless they're understanding why they're doing it. No method is more effective than a good example. I'm not going to really go out to you, but I think he had a very good sense, which I think is also one of the key success factors why I feel managed to grow so tremendously as we have. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I can't see you, but um, thanks a lot for listening. Any comments, questions? Thank you. Thanks, Henrik. Yeah, we have a few questions and I'm sure there's going to be more coming up. Let me just put the Mentimeter link again there. So if, you know, as we take those questions that are already there and go deeper into them, you might have all the questions bubbling up. So don't, feel free to put them there, add them, and we'll be coming to them. We've got a few already. And I'm going to start with um, one that is a bit generic. Um, so let's just start there about understanding this framework that you are sharing with us. And the question is, if you could elaborate on the terms simplistic versus simplicity, and perhaps yeah. define each term. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, uh... It's my own interpretation. So, uh, but for me, a simplistic <laughs> idea is, is when you have something that sounds good. I mean, uh, sorry for using this time of the world, but I mean, okay. everyone knows peace is good. But saying we're going to achieve peace by taking away all arms in the world, that's a simplistic approach to peace. The world is much more complicated. We need to find different balances. We need to have the United Nations, etc. right? And I think when you start understanding deeply how something moves, then you become a master. Oh, no, too much animations in this presentation. So, um, that's when you can start truly understanding. So, I mean, the simplicity Ingva found out for IKEA for me was very simple, right? 
So standardized logistics have a very, very limited range. The IKEA range was a very long time, not allowed to do more than 10,000 articles. Have a common trade dress around the world and delegate the rest. That was what's worked for IKEA. It's different for different things. But often, um, simplistic is this uh, one line is that you throw because they sound good. Simplicity is when you truly understand that I'm just behind driving factors and are able to respond in a good way. So I, I would say maybe these micro loans, you know, that we do in the third world or the developing world, is a good way of understanding simplicity because then you see how, how is the economy interacting. Okay, it's not huge, um, but of course, welfare programs, etc. But if you give people means, they're going to organize it and use it in the best of worlds. So it's better to provide a lot of small loans than one big investment. I, I hope that clarifies a bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it looks like that's helpful. People are nodding. So yeah, uh -huh. there's, a couple, there's a couple of questions on, on strategy, tactics, goals, OKRs, and, and IKEA. And there's one that is asking, if there is a sequence, how you define all those elements? Like, do you need to have OKRs uh, in place first to, in order to create or refine the tactics? Or what is the relationship between all those elements? If, if there is a sequence? I don't think there is a sequence. I mean, in, I think another simplistic example is, uh, Professor Balthazar, I don't know his English name, have you seen in a chef uh, story about this professor? He runs into different problems. He takes in all the data, he goes home, so thinking, 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 and then every time he pulls a magic lever in the machine and now drops a brick and he drops it and it magically solves a problem. I think this is something that needs to be integrated and defined because when you start pushing, the world is going to start pushing back and you have responses that you need to consider. Hmm. Um, for our world, um, but in uh, IKEA, we have always used strategy as a smorgasbord. Since we had a very high autonomy, what we normally have done is that in uh, week 46, so in the Swedish autumn, all the store managers came to Sweden to Elmhurst, the heart of IKEA, and we presented the new range that we were supposed to be selling the next year, so we had that in cycle of five months almost. And then also the different strategies are presented, but they are written as inspirational documents, meaning that everyone interprets them for themselves. Uh, so then we didn't really have this tactic layer, but when you build an omni-channel, Austria is becoming dependent on the digital organization, and if we build a wonderful new digital product and Australia doesn't use it, it's no good, right? So they are much more interdependent now, means that we need to coordinate much more on a lower level. But for me, I mean, in the position I'm sitting, and I, I guess that's contextual, so take it with a pinch of salt, right? But the objectives and the tactics are the most important. And they need to feed each other because, well, as I said, when you start choosing one direction, you choose the other directions. So you can't just um, staple a number of objectives that feel good on top of each other because they might at least indirectly be conflicting. Hmm. Hmm. There's, um, there's another question about this topic. So I'm going to go with that one first, and then there's a few others. Uh, but there's a question around, I guess just a reflection around strategy and tactics and business capability mapping uh, look like tools for complicated world, not really made for complexity. And the question is, how do you make them work in that complex space? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I should disagree or not, so I'm just going to talk about it. <laughs> so, so we have our own business capability model. Uh, we have decided that we can only have one capability model. Of course, we need one common language. It's a simplification of the world. We have rules and guidelines. We have a playbook how to use the capabilities. Um, so we have, of course, as I said, three layers. The top layer is 16 capabilities from sort of strategy planning to HR. 
which is just a container that's not really useful for anything. And then we have around 200 level two capabilities which we use for the strategy planning. My personal belief is that 100 is a magic number because if you have 10 of something, it's normally a wet blanket that covers everything. So if, if you had uh, 10 capabilities in IKEA, marketing, selling, it doesn't help you, right? If you go down to a thousand, you just get a can of worms because then it's too much to take in as a community, as a group, as a person to understand. So try to stay around a hundred and then you sequence it. I'm a development team. I maybe have 10 capabilities I need to be aware of. If I'm doing uh, our audience management system, I don't really know need to care about how we do uh, salary management, etc. Mm. Mm. That's I, a very interesting. Oh, sorry, Ivo. Sorry. No, no, so, so try, try to keep it to a hundred in order to not become because there is a definite risk, and I agree. But as an engineer, you you rather be. Uh, true or right than get right, right? So you might end up spending your whole day just building a capability enough to describe everything in the world. And then you're wrong to it because it has to be accepted by everyone and liked by no one. That's the sort of um, <laughs> unfair world mm. of a capability map. Hmm. So there's a very interesting question here that I'm really keen, just as the person who um, who added it, uh, to know your thoughts around. And the context is that some would suggest that you know some that OKRs are really well aligned with teams and self organizations um, or self organized teams. What are, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? How how do you see that alignment happening or not happening? Uh, um... Well, that's a tough question. I mean, we have, as I said, we're pursuing OPRs. We've done it a bit differently, meaning that we have, uh, in short, in the digital organization, we have a digital product, which is sort of trying to create the customer value, then we have engineering, et cetera. In the digital products, we have a number of domains, so customer domain, innovation domain, et cetera. All of these have their own OPRs, which we need to coordinate between the different teams. So the marketing team, have the same high level objective as the selling team. Before we had that, we had a lot of conflicts because we are interdependent. The selling team needed something from the customer database and they go, oh no, that's not in our objectives and it's not prioritized in our backlog. And we were sort of locking each other up because you mm -hmm. were sitting waiting and then it's easy to say, oh, we don't have APIs. But it, it doesn't cover everything. A lot of the time you need adjustments and understanding. And in the same way, maybe the, yeah, some other team is dependent on the selling team, right? Then they are sitting waiting with their thing for the marketing team. So uh, I think, and that, that's my point. I mean, you cannot always be totally anonymous, but you need to interact where it matters and you need to do it as little as possible. If that makes sense. So, so I think it's, I mean, OKR is in my mind, just qualitative and quantitative goals mixed into one. So it's just a different way of describing a goal. And I think you always need goals, but you also need to agree on how to reach the goal. Hmm. Hmm. Align, align with that, but um, yeah, pun intended, not intended, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned in one of your slides that the more alignment, the slower the process is. And yeah. Thinking about um, even about OKRs, but also a strategy and how how could you elaborate on how do you create alignment across the organization? If it's not by involving everyone, which I get that you can do, but what is your process to creating and finding that alignment across the organization? Yeah, uh, in IKEA we chose to have what we call the ten jobs in three years. Um, so I showed you job four, which is about services. And that is a cross-functional alignment team. So it's people from digital, it's people from the countries, it's people from the global organization. Um, and then what we try to also add on top of that is actually what we call business products. So if we look at, for instance, a reward system, 
of course, there's a technical component. What have you done? How many reward points do you have? When do you claim them? There's an economical uh, side to it. So how do we, in our books, in an accounting, make sure that we go to rewards? It's a legal thing. It might be considered a bribe in one country. It might be illegal to connect it or show it in another country, etc. right? And then you need, of course, to understand how do people act incentives and rewards. You might need a psychologist, a gaming expert, and they need to come together in a team say, we owe this value proposition or offering to a customer, we need to align it. So I think you need to have several autonomous but cross-dependent teams working on different things. And then you need to do the trade-off, which of course in a company like IKEA takes a huge time because we have a lot of different things. Mm. But it, 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 it always has to be organic. I think that's my key point. You can never sort of sit top down and do a mechanical structure and get it to work. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, um, there is a question we're getting here into all the territory that I, I, I personally love. So the question is, other than in the document, what is IKEA doing to reduce fear of mistakes? And specifically, if you could share any practices. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that Kia has, um, uh, we have a very inclusive and forgiving culture in itself. And I, I would say we, um, our problem is not the fear of making mistakes. <clears throat> of course, it can happen, but. I mean, when my program manager a couple of years ago presented the CRM program to uh, the highest steering in the committee, it ended up with a group hug. That, that's the type of management we have, right? So, so I don't think anyone um, is really fearful. So, so I think we have a good culture to start with. So it's a bit like a fish in the water, right? I, I think I have a hard time elaborating around it. But it's also, I mean, this radical collaboration, right? Which it has tried it. So, so, what I see as sort of secure in my back, you will see as a skill. And we have all that in our management trainings, in our onboarding sessions. And then, of course, we have a lot of sharing sessions, et cetera, where we we'll try to share both bad and good. Mm. Yeah. The, um... There is another question here that I don't know if some of you attended um, the session with Lisa Gill yesterday and see that on it uh, briefly. And, you know, she was already talking about different people having different perspectives and, and ideas of what, um, what works. Yeah, if, I don't know. Uh, let, let me put the question out there and see. Um, so the question is around mindset and structures. And whether the whether you would say that the mindset helps you be agile, or is it more the structures that you created that helps you be more agile? Um, and they're giving an example. Even are people just pragmatic in that operating model, and mindset is the reason why it really works, mm -hmm. or is it the structure that you've created that actually promotes this um, different way of working? I have a slide somewhere I can include it in the deck before we share with this an appendix. But <clears throat> at least in the old times in Ikea, we talked about agile thinking or agile being and agile doing. So, I mean, just because you have a stand up and a scrum, you're not agile. Mm. Doing that would be simplistic. When you really, I mean, for me, the core of the agile is the Uda loop. Uh, so observe oriented side act, meaning that you need to see the world in a circular way, not in a linear way. Then you start getting into that agile mindset, and that's when you have the simplicity, right? When you, or when you start to understand, we cannot control, and since we cannot control, we cannot plan. We need to send some response. And if you have that mindset in everything you do, you are a much more agile organization, no matter if you have the standards or not. Mm. Yeah, I, I hope that answers the question there. Um, I, I, I wonder if this, this is quite complex, um, and I wonder how do you make all this complexity 
visible to IKEA team members? Uh, that, that's what we're working right now. So we have mm -hmm. some um, plots at least. Um, so what we see as the sort of uh, factor where we want to build the corporate roadmap is around the problems to solve based on sort of strategy and tactics and objectives. And for each of these problems, we try to do a heat map to so say, okay, you want to establish a rewards program. Okay, uh, sort of point management is a huge capability gap because we don't have it at all. Payments is not the capability gap for a rewards program, inventory management might be your accounting. So, so that's the sort of level two capabilities I talked about to present that this is your context. These are the capabilities that you need in order to succeed with this idea. Well, at least to provide the output we think is going to be successful because we don't know if you're going to respond to rewards, right? We can only offer them. And then we need to test. And if it doesn't work, we need to test something else. Um, and then, as I said, then you need to see, okay, if I have a payment technique, who is the product owner of payments? Do I need it only online? Do I need it in the store? Can I start online? Because that might be faster than changing the tool systems because they are often under uh, legal audit and stuff, right? Uh, and then you need to talk to that team and say, okay, based on this goal, this strategy, this objective, this is a problem we would like to solve. Are you able to prioritize it? And they might go, yeah, we have this from a couple of different things. So now this is actually super unique. We have enormous problem with this integration or we need to do this tackle availability or COVID or whatever. So that we can help you now. And then I know that, okay, this might still be a good idea, but I can't pursue it right now. So we need to hold it. We could try to validate it in a prototype or a standalone thing if we don't want to have the knowledge. But that's the type of steering you need to iterate it with a build, right? Now that you're on that slide, actually, there's another question about who decides in which bucket of you know, agile projects or lines um, an, uplift, an uplift fits. Is it portfolio management or how, how does that process work? Who is making that decision? Everyone. Oh, can you say <laughs> more about that? No, I mean, uh, we, we did a huge transformation a couple of years ago. Before that, we had a super structured uh, design process with a different toll gates, a classical waterfall project model. Uh, then we abandoned it fully and said that every project manager uh, decides for themselves, so we have no steering. Um, that, of course, as I said, didn't work either because we have the interdependencies. But I mean, in short, of course, the line is very much steered by our business plan. And um, they, of course, have different teams and economy what they do, but they need to sort of cooperate and we use uh, what we call value streams to have a lot of these corporations. Projects are funded and they could, of course, go outside the digital organization to buy stuff as well. But we are trying to have an architecture in place to make sure that we don't build duplicate systems, etc. And here we have the steering through the objective dimension. So we have the product manager, we have a domain manager, we have a senior pro of the product manager, and then we have senior product owner, product owner. So that's an hierarchy. I mean, in this domain, where we're like 4,000 people, so it's a lot of <laughs> coordination to do. But in the end, I mean, you are accountable as a product owner for the decisions you make. And you, you have to a very high degree the mandate of saying no. I mean, I could have a super good uh, idea, which is backing by the whole leadership team of IKEA. But if you sit here as a product owner and know that if I don't do this update to the report of the accounting system, the CEO in Germany is going to go to jail. And hopefully, you have a guts to prioritize that higher than an idea just because it comes from top management. Mm. So stretching it to the extreme, but that's always the type of trade off you need to have. And I mean, that could change. No one expected the war two weeks ago. No one expected COVID. And then you need to be able to reprioritize, of course. And we do 
touchers. So we try to lock the common four months. We have two touchers to there where we try to have a fairly good scope in order for the teams to make sure that they can trust that whatever commitment they got from other teams. Mm. Um, yeah, can you can you say more about how you make decisions in IKEA? Like I know that that's a very general question, but <laughs> but um, what? Yeah, how do you how do you make decisions uh, collectively in IKEA or not collectively? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, the, the sort of transformation decision structure, which I know the best, is on top. Uh, of course, top top we have uh, the Campbell and the IT Foundation board. But if we go down to the sort of operational level, we have uh, the DIT, so the Development, Innovation, and Transformation Office. Mm. And below that, we have uh, Enterprise Planning. And then below that, we have uh, the different domains. So normally sort of enterprise planning tries to look into what are the problems to solve we need to prioritize. Uh, the DIT looks at the tactics and what problems to solve that should get created. It's not fully up and running. And then down here, we of course have normal agile. So sprint planning, sprint releases, Someone, some does program implement, etc. Down here, we have the portfolio management team with the portfolio budget. So, so, it's a couple of different decision factors. And then, of course, each line has their own function, uh, budget, and roles, and steering, which is a bit different. And the markets are quite strong mm. as well. Cool. In, in deal, as you know, we uh, when we talk about decision making, we, we talk about different sources of information that we use to make decisions. And those include rationality, you know, data, information, analytical approaches, um, um, yeah, rules. Um, and then we also include and integrate emotions and intuition mm -hmm. and paradoxical, uh, paradoxical thinking in, in in you know in the the different input that we use um, to make decisions. So how do you um, which ones of these do you integrate in the decision making in IKEA and and how do you do it? Yeah, I guess it's different for different uh, parts, but but we are uh, um, we are a very human centered organization. Mm. Um, so it's a lot about gut feeling. It's a lot about we are trying to become data driven and make sure that we have the same data and make it available. Uh, we are to a very little degree steered by uh, business rules, processes, etc. But then, then I think everyone finds their own working order. But then normally you have the sort of core that you have an acceptance for, and then mm. you need to sort of take that to other parts of the organization and based on your response, you shape the outcome. So, mm. so it's, uh, it's a very, I would say in that sense, team organization, it's not the fixed order and the model. The mm -hmm. order and control or whatever you call it, right? I need more coffee, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and then of course, it, it's different in different parts. I mean, the budget process is much more structured and, uh, mm. Old fashion. I mean, we have been looking into beyond budget in these initiatives, but it's still, of course, you have your uh, booking periods, you have your accounting rules that you need to follow. Uh, we try to have a single sort of source of value. And I normally say that my job is to tell my people. So I sit here um, working with a number of different teams. And my job is normally to tell them what is important for IKEA. Mm. And then that is one dimension of what they need to plan for. Then, of course, you have legal change, you have your own life cycle, you have uh, DevOps. So it could be a lot of things they need to take into consideration on the team level down here. On the other hand, if we decide to do a reward program, we don't care if we are moving it over to more of the databases or not. Mm. 
Or is it a super huge question? So the question no, would be, no, the answer um, would be a <laughs> We can, um, we've got about three minutes or so before I have to close and, and share all the things. Uh, I'm really curious, personally curious about what is your own definition of leadership? Yeah, I strongly believe, I mean, first of all, uh, being a gardener, mm -hmm. you can never sort of control and sphere change, you need to respond. And you also, of course, need to be a bit of a motivator, and then you need to understand, uh, of course, <laughs> where you want to go. So you need a bit of everything, but I think mostly a gardener, <clears throat> and also, of course, of a lot of humbleness, knowing that you don't have the truth knowing that there are other ways of reaching the same goal that are for the other goals which are as important as yours. So, so I think it's not being afraid of being uncomfortable, but mm. uh, also mostly not sort of pushing the real through. And I think that's a sort of super trick. And of course, as a friend of mine said, I think one of the key challenges for a leader, especially if you come in high corporate level, is to balance autonomy and uh, economy of scales. Because if you really let everyone do exactly what they like, you never have the steering of the company. But if you only have steering, you have no motivation left. Mm. And of course, then we try also in IT and evaluation and the development side to accept that it's happened these different things. Cool. Oh, well, I'm going to start wrapping up and closing. Um, and first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Like my mind is buzzing, like so much information. I kind of want to dive into all those slides and things that you've shared with us. Um, and yeah, complexity is not my happy place. So thank you for making it a little bit more, a little bit more approachable and easier to understand for me and hopefully for others as well. Um, so thank you so much, Henrik, thanks for that. Um, now when, and thank you everyone else for being here and for putting, sharing your questions, that's always super rich and we can have a conversation and deepen, deepen what we're learning. So now once we close Zoom, we will be meeting uh, on, again, like I said at the beginning, if you've joined other sessions uh, during this year still around the world, you know this is what happens. If you haven't, we will be um, continuing the conversation and consolida consolidating the learnings and reflecting a little bit on what we've heard um, on a special chat. Let me put the link in the chat, but before we do that, I'll tell you how to join. So when you click on that, link, uh, you make sure that you activate your camera and your mic before you join. And then you will, you will see that you arrive at um, like the entrance of a digital building. And then from there, if you go to the right hand side, you can open a panel um, and then you will see different, different rooms, different spaces, because it's all outdoors. So you'll have to find garden number four. And once you go there, we'll have a space for this group to keep the conversation going. Henrik, you're more welcome to join us. Um, and yeah, I will be there for a few minutes starting the conversation and then I'll leave you to it. One small thing, oh, make sure that you close Zoom before you join a special chat because sometimes uh, the audio, there's some incompatibility or something that makes the audio don't work if you haven't closed um, Zoom. So having said that, right half a minute before the time, I'll just close this one and see you there. We'll see you at a special in a special. And I have my address. I have my address in the presentation, so don't hesitate to reach out. I will join the chat for a bit of time as well. I have a stand up that is conflicting, but I'll provide. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for that, for making yourself available as well. Yeah. And thank you everyone. We'll see you, see you in a special chat. Thank you. Bye-bye.